Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Uh, so happy to be with you this morning. Beautiful day. Uh, just a couple announcements I want to go over with you. Again, they're printed for you in the bulletin, but sometimes I just like to read to you. So we're going to start off that way, I guess. Um, a reminder that those updated member directories as well as the new April calendars are available at the Welcome Center. Uh, also, um, today being Palm Sunday, the Women of Faith Circle invite everyone, please join them uh, after our service this morning. They've got coffee cake and coffee and juice uh, available for you in the memorial room. Something along the lines of nobody gets out till the food is gone was mentioned. So um, join for some fellowship if you've got time to do that today. Uh, I will invite you, um, it's, it's not printed for you, but on Monday, Thursday, uh, if you're interested in a Monday, Thursday service, Excelsior uh, is holding one at 7 p.m. if you'd like to join me there. Our Good Friday service here at Faith, uh, 7 p.m. on Friday. And then uh, one week from today, friends, it will be Easter Sunday, and uh, we'll have choir performance, and I look forward to that worship service with you every year. Uh, in terms of other announcements, maybe not calendar related, but something that I would like to uh, draw attention to. Um, my son-in-law has learned that pastor's kids are fair game. So I would like to point out that Kyle and Rachel uh, yesterday donated or cut to be donated somewhere between 8, 10, 12 inches of their hair collectively uh, to go to an organization uh, for children with hair loss, where they make hair pieces and make some things. And since they usually sit in the front, everybody's going to notice that ponytail has diminished. So um, I, I appreciate uh, whenever we have those type of efforts in our community and love to raise awareness for that. So it just happens to be my kids that get the, the attention today. Um, I will ask as we move toward our time of worship, um, just take a moment, friends, to uh, open your hearts, clear your minds. Uh, I'd like to call you to worship with prayer. Gracious and glorious Father in heaven, bless our time of worship this morning. We're asking to be filled with your spirit, surrounded by your presence. Would you open your word to us today, Lord? Would you uh, open our eyes, our ears, our minds, our hearts, that we might grow closer to you in relationship, that we might become more aware, that we might maybe see something new um, as we approach the, the days of Holy Week to come, uh, starting Looking at Palm Sunday today, Lord, we, we think the stories are familiar. Maybe show us something new. Give us a new perspective. Uh, transform us. Revive us in your spirit today. Again, be with us. Touch our hearts. And guide us in this time together. It's in your name we pray. <coughs> Amen. So I wanted to ask, um, what would you do? If you knew that you had less than two weeks to live, uh, how many of you have a bucket list already that you, things you want to do? Just Tom, okay. Um, what would you do if you knew you had less than two weeks to accomplish anything of significance? Or less than two weeks to spend with your loved ones? Less than two weeks. Today is Palm Sunday. It's a day when traditionally we remember the entry of the Lord into Jerusalem, the sound of the cheering crowds and smiling faces, a day when he was welcomed with shouts of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But for just a moment today, I want to back up. We're going to wrap up our, our sermon series that we've been in, Meals with Jesus. Um, by meeting the Lord at the second to last supper recorded in scripture. That's a supper that took place when he had less than two weeks left in his life. And it's to Jericho that we're going today. Um, we're gonna 
Be in the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. If you'd like to follow along, open your Bibles or open your Bible apps. Uh, I won't be reading it word for word, but you can easily follow along. You might find the story familiar. Uh, I'm going to ask you to put yourself there, uh, not just literally in your Bible, but figuratively in your mind, and imagine Jericho for a moment. Um, Very famous, perfumed city. Uh, renowned the world over for its balsam from which uh, this perfume was made. It's, it's been said that that very distinct and sweet scent uh, just hung in the air, even from miles away from that fortified city. And there were palm trees that grew in abundance. Uh, the air was always warm. The streets were just canopied with spreading branches, spreading trees. Uh, in Jericho, in this city, It was a dwelling place for probably more than half of the priests who were actively serving in the temple at Jerusalem. And um, the scripture we're looking at today, the city turned out to welcome Jesus as he passed through the gates of the city. Uh, Surely he was probably surrounded when he arrived by his ever-present disciples, but also uh, there would have been scores of pilgrims making their way through Jericho to Jerusalem uh, for the annual feast of Passover, which was about to begin. And when I think of that scene, um, do you think anyone took notice of the look of determination on Jesus' face? Or were they so caught up in all the joy of spring and Passover that they didn't notice uh, that the master had a very resolute demeanor on that day? Um, There again, he had less than two weeks to live at that point. And the Lord was being very intentional. He's very certain to make the most of every moment, make every moment count. There was a purpose for this journey to the perfumed city. Um, If Jericho had had many priests as residents, it also seemed to have just as many publicans, tax collectors everywhere, uh, because this was a, a wealthy city. And where there was money, there were those anxious to collect that money, whether they did it on the guise of you know, giving Caesar his share or if it was to line their own pockets in the process. There was money, there were tax collectors. And the head of all these tax collectors, the ruler of them all, an unassuming man of small stature, a man whose name meant pure, but he was anything but pure. I'm talking about Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, the chief publican. He was a man who had everything that wealth had to offer. Imagine him in the best designer robes, the finest Italian sandals, uh, gold rings on every finger. He owned a home in a very exclusive district of town, not far from the royal palace built by Herod's son. His home would have had every imaginable amenity and luxury, uh, probably pools of water filled with exotic fish and beautiful balsam groves and shady palm trees. There would have been servants lining the hallways just awaiting his beck and call. Um, He would have had a lot of fine art, pottery, sculptures to provide interest for his occasional visitors. Uh, Probably had a Roman bath in which he could recline most of his day. Uh, There would have been no expense spared in the construction of his home. He seemed to have it all. Yet in spite of all that, Zacchaeus, he just seemed to know that something was missing. And we think about this for a moment, it's, I wonder why he went after so much wealth. Um, it's kind of a crooked way to do it, but obviously money was very important to him. Why had he chosen this profession? I wonder if maybe it wasn't the best way he could get revenge on those who had tormented him so mercilessly growing up. Um, Surely he had a difficult time and he was picked on. Even How many of you know the song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Guys, how many of you are like, boy, I hope I get called that, right? He was probably what we would call bullied, picked on, insecure. Maybe, you know, he's thinking, I'm going to show them. I'm, I'm going to pimp taxes for Rome, and I'm going to take all their money, and I'm going to live the life. I'll, I'll show them. 
Maybe it his, you know, was his way of compensating for his lack of stature, to make himself feel bigger. Uh, surely people respected gold, so they would respect a man who held gold. But you know, it didn't work. For all of his wealth, Zacchaeus just felt empty. And he came to the streets that day with kind of this hollowness or um, maybe even a sickening feeling that kind of haunted his every moment, that something was missing, something he couldn't buy, something he couldn't seem to find. I'm thinking, wow, wouldn't he fit in great in our current modern day society? Um, So many of us, we know what it's like to feel like something is missing, to be looking for something. Um, Who hasn't chased down the end of the rainbow only to find that pot's full of fool's gold, right? Do you know that feeling? The feeling that maybe you're lost and you're searching for something that you can't find. And maybe you have searched for it. Maybe you thought, you know, if I could just find love, that would be it. Or if I had more money, uh, that would do it. Or, Or maybe it was success. Or maybe it's even religion for you. But yet you're still empty. Even uh, with Zacchaeus feeling that way, knowing he's missing something, knowing he feels empty, I still have to stop and wonder, why did he want to see Jesus on that day? Why specifically was that his plan? In a city like Jericho, again, populated as it was with so many priests, uh, Zacchaeus, you know, would he really just come to see a a religious leader? Because he he could have sought out a rabbi any day, every day where he lived. Was it curiosity? that brought him from his mansion out to the streets? Was it, was it hope? Hope that Jesus might offer something he hadn't, hadn't tried yet? Or was it something maybe less tangible, something, uh, just some sort of sense that he, he had to see Jesus? I just need to see Jesus. Maybe, maybe I just need to talk to him for a moment. Did Zacchaeus feel guilty? for the life that he was leading? Was his conscience playing a role as he sought out the Lord? Did he have a a gut feeling? Or did he, like so many today, simply feel a roving anxiety that he wrote off as indigestion or insomnia? Did Zacchaeus actually expect to meet the Lord? Or did he just want to see if this rabbi looked different from the others? Had he heard Jesus speak, or had he just heard the whispers of Jesus' teaching that was going around in so many popular conversations? We don't know. Scripture doesn't answer those questions, but it does tell us that Zacchaeus' desire to see Jesus was so strong that he was willing to risk stepping into a less-than-friendly crowd unprotected. Zacchaeus must have been black and blue by midday from all the elbows he received, the prods in the crowd. But no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't break through the crowd to see Jesus. So he threw aside his pride and his sense of decorum, and running ahead of the procession, he climbed up one of the sycamore fig trees that spread over the street. And from this vantage point, he'd be sure to see Jesus as he passed by. Have you ever been this desperate to find something. Desperate enough to not care what anybody else thinks. Desperate enough to risk insult and injury. Desperate enough to look dumb. Have you ever found yourself up the tree clinging to a branch and clinging to the hope that, you know, knowing nothing can get worse, maybe this is something that I'm seeking that will make things better. Jesus does tell us, keep seeking, you will find. And then the moment finally arrives. The procession seemed to crawl up the road toward that tree, but at last Jesus was passing by right below Zacchaeus. And it happened. The completely unexpected, it happened. Jesus stopped and he peered through the branches and looked right into the eyes of Zacchaeus. 
What did Zacchaeus see when he looked into the eyes of Jesus? What did, what did Jesus silently communicate? Um, Jesus' eyes always seemed to see more than anyone else's could, and people knew it. And then Jesus spoke. He said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down immediately. Make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Again, put yourself there. Can you imagine the crowd at that point? There, there had to have been an audible gasp. I'm sure there was murmurs of disapproval of all the homes to go to in Jericho, this city that's full of priests and devout Jews, and Jesus chooses the most hated man in the city, the head tax collector. That's where he's going to go? First, I want to point out what our scripture says. Verse 6, So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. I'll read that again. I don't want you to miss the significance of what Luke is telling us. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Already we know that Zacchaeus has responded with faith. He understood that Jesus was inviting himself to dinner, but he's also inviting Zacchaeus to enter the kingdom through faith. And he joyfully received him. The second point of interest took place at the table of Zacchaeus. In verse 8, we're told that Zacchaeus stood up and made this declaration. He says, look, Lord, I give half of my goods. I'll give half of my wealth to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. He's saying, hey, if I've cheated anybody on their taxes, I'm going to return to them four times as much. And Jesus said to him, today... Salvation has come to this house. What saved Zacchaeus? The fact that he'd given up all he had? Hey, Jesus, I'm going to give up everything and I'm going to make everything right. And Jesus says, salvation comes. Is he saved because he gives everything up? No. No. That's not what this says. In fact, It's that Zacchaeus has received Jesus in faith with joy. The surrendering of all he has is simply the outworking of that salvation. It's because Zacchaeus found in the Lord something worth more than all he had. We learn from Zacchaeus here, just like we do in so many places in Scripture, salvation has a transformational element. It's able to take the hardest, most jaded character, and replace any bitterness with joy. But only when the good news of the kingdom is welcomed and received. And if we look at Jesus' words in verse 10, Jesus concludes this episode with Zacchaeus by saying, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. And I love that. It's, it's interesting. We, as we come to know Scripture more and more, we discover there's something so much deeper happening in this story. Something maybe stranger and more powerful than any of us would have expected. Something that would have even shocked little Zacchaeus had he known. At first glance, it appears that Zacchaeus, who feels there's something missing, he's the one looking, seeking. But Jesus' comment tells us that Jesus also came to Jericho that day looking for something. That he too came with the sense that something wasn't right. Something or someone was missing. That Jesus himself felt incomplete. So think about that. Have you ever caught yourself saying, there are so many people in this world that are lost. Imagine how Jesus feels incomplete. By that. He's missing something. I want you to, again, use your mind's eye, picture this scene. We're making our way down the street. The crowd is encompassing from all around. And we notice this character who is searching. 
is scanning back and forth, but unable to see the one that he's looking for because the crowd is blocking his view. The crowd is jubilant, joyful, pressing in, jostling in on him. And moving along the road, he sees a sycamore tree just ahead. That is surely where he is going to go. That's where he will encounter him. He knows it. So making his way in that direction, he heads down the road toward the tree. Takes a few moments to get there. The crowds are thick. But arriving at the base of the tree, he stops. And there he tips his head back and looks up. And sure enough, there in the tree, legs dangling like a little child, clinging to a branch for dear life, is the one that he came seeking, a lost son by the name of Zacchaeus. For those of you that nodded your head when I said you know the song, right? Zacchaeus, you come down. Anybody going to sing it? You can come up. Come down, for I'm coming to your house today. Were you surprised a little bit at the scene? Did you miss the fact that while Zacchaeus came seeking something he didn't rightly understand, the Lord Jesus came seeking Zacchaeus? The words he used make it clear that was part of his mandate. He says, I must stay at your house. Does it surprise you to know that the Lord is seeking you? Be reminded, all of this happens no more than two weeks before the cross. Jesus has left Nazareth for the last time. He's not going to look upon Capernaum again. He will not walk the shore of the Galilee until after the cross. The next week is going to be a roller coaster. Many emotions as crowds greet him as their king at the beginning of Passover, but by the end of the week turn him over to be crucified. And in the middle of this story in Jericho, we see an extraordinary parallel. Zacchaeus stands up and professes, I surrender all that I have so that I can have you. And Jesus' reply is very similar. I surrender all that I am to make you mine. And if you're reading along and you're saying, wait, I don't see it. Where does he say that? It's in that phrase that reads, today salvation has come to this house. Jesus knows that in order to forgive this man's sin, he's going to have to bear it on the cross. And he says, I surrender my life for yours. So at the table of Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector, we meet a man who sought and found what he was looking for, and he was profoundly transformed by the experience. Please don't miss the fact here, friends, that he didn't say, well, I'm going to try to change, and I'm going to clean up my act, and then I'll find Jesus. I'm going to quit smoking and quit drinking and quit lying, and then I'll come to church. It's quite the opposite here, right? He knew something was missing in his life, and he had a feeling that that missing piece was Jesus, and he went for it. He climbed a tree, took a risk, he went looking, and then Jesus changed his life. That's the Zacchaeus sitting at the table, transformed and saved. And across the table, we find the master who has also sought and found what he was looking for. And he will shortly be irrevocably changed to complete the experience. And I wonder, if you were to look closely at the faces at that table, would you find your own? As another who was sought and found by one who has given all to own you. And if you're sitting at this table today, that question remains, will the experience leave you changed? I pray that it does. Friends, I'm going to ask you to open your hymnals.
the number 488. And we're going to sing together just as I am, number 488. There continues to be those special prayer requests that are printed in the bulletin for you. Uh, I'll remind you, if, if you've got joys or concerns that you would like to share with the congregation, uh, go ahead and let us know here at the church office whether you want that sent out immediately by email or if you want it printed in the bulletin. We're, we're happy to share those prayer concerns with you. Uh, there is an update out the, at the Welcome Center uh, for Terry Williams McDonald, her situation there. Her husband does a beautiful job uh, journaling, for lack of a better term, uh, their, their journey together. And uh, Greg was kind enough to print off one of the recent journal entries, and that's, that's out at the Welcome Center again with um, kind of an update on her situation. Uh, keep in your prayers uh, our friend Mick, who has had some interesting events happen in his recovery. He got to go to Sioux Falls and have another procedure this past week, but I understand that procedure has really turned things around for him. So. Uh, he is eating at this point and feeling better, so keep him in your prayers. Uh, Joanne, keep her in your prayers that she will behave herself and take her cane when she's supposed to. And uh, we, we pray for you, Joanne, that you will, uh, on your health journey as well, uh, that you might have a, a medical team with much wisdom and care for you. Uh, Lynn is home. So uh, she welcomes your visits and your calls, but she says, please do check in advance because she still has doctor appointments and physical therapy, home health, things like that. Uh, so she would appreciate if you'd just give her a call and let her know when you might visit. Uh, also, I, I don't have an update for you on, on Natalie, who has been 
reassigned with the Peace Corps in Paraguay. I, I, um, several of you have asked. I don't know yet exactly where she has landed and how that has worked out, but I will update you as soon as I know. And uh, again, this week, keep Ken and Sharon in your prayers following the passing of their grandson recently. So um, all of that being said, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Eternal and loving God, first we give you thanks, always we give you thanks, and we come to you today to pray for others. Lord, for those who are seeking For those who know there is something missing and they're still searching, we pray for that, that day and that moment when they understand that Jesus is seeking them too. For those places that are empty, we pray that they can be filled. For those gaps in the road, we pray that you can build bridges. Lord, we know that uh, there's no guarantee of, of having no storms in our lives, but we also know that you're the one to calm those storms. And sometimes, Lord, it's not the storm that needs to calm, it's us. Uh, for those who are struggling with anything in their life that has them feeling anxious, uncertain, unsafe, insecure. We lift them up to you today, Lord, and ask that uh, so many times we pray your, your spirit, your presence, but maybe it needs to be something they can really grab a hold of. Can you, can you just act in our lives, Lord, in a way that we can see and understand and feel so that we might replace all those feelings of uncertainty and anxiety, those, we can replace that with peace, assurance, joy. We pray for our friends, our families, our church family, our community, our country, our world. Again, for those places we find a bump in the road or, or Lord, where we can't find the road. Whatever that struggle or strife looks like, whatever we encounter, the little stuff, the big stuff, for people who are every day using words like cancer, terminal, treatment, divorce, loss, grief. Lord, help us to see how we might step in, how we can see others through your eyes, work with your hands, walk with your feet. Light our path. Guide us. Make us to be the disciples that you created us to be. We are so thankful, Lord, for who we are and whose we are. And we are ready to get to work. Lead us through the days of this holy week, understanding your journey and what that means for us, how that changes our journey, how we are transformed, how we might serve one another. Lord, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Give ear to my words, O oh Lord. Consider
We've been to Jericho. Now we're headed to Jerusalem. We're going to catch up to this day, Palm Sunday. I'm reading to you from the book of John, chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Friends, would you open your hymnals, and we're going to join together in some praise, some singing, uh, hymn number 300 and 301. Let's stand and sing together. When Jesus enters Jerusalem on that final week, the crowds are waiting and they shout and they celebrate. This is our king. It's the one we've been waiting for. But then the next day, Jesus enters the temple and there he finds money changers and people dealing out goods to take advantage of the poor, the poor who have come to worship at the temple. And Jesus 
fashions a whip, turns over the tables and drives out the money changers. Jesus shouts, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. We're told that when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, they kept looking for a way to kill him. And by Friday, they got their wish. The same crowds who had on Sunday yelled, Hosanna, are now bloodthirsty and yelling, crucify him. It's amazing what change a week can bring. And it's during that week that Jesus, knowing what was to come, gathered his disciples, instituting what we now refer to as the Last Supper. He took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, when the supper was over, he took the cup, He gave thanks. He gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We do this in remembrance of Jesus. Today we also remember that when Jesus left the loud, triumphant crowds of Palm Sunday, it was the very next day he entered the temple on Monday and he found a place where he was outraged by the discrimination. He turned over the tables of those who stood in the way of people and their God. He ran them out of the temple. My house will be called the house of prayer for all people. All people. Jesus' own religious leaders couldn't stomach this action, so they carried out their plot to kill him. Why do we fear others so much? Why are we scared of those who are different? Why do we build walls and pass laws and fight for our right to segregate, discriminate, or hate. Scripture tells us, for God so loved the world. The world doesn't say the world except for someone. The whole world. Jesus came for all people, and Jesus has prepared this table for all people. Have we not learned that in our series as we've been having these meals with Jesus? No matter who you are, what you've done, where you are in your faith journey, Jesus welcomes you at his table. This house is a house of prayer for all nations. This is a table for all people. Today we say, Hosanna, blessed are all who come in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. In your name we pray. Amen. Indeed, we serve an open table here. You need not be a member of this church or any church to partake. Jesus invites to his table all who love him and earnestly repent of their sin. We do the same. I'm going to ask that you might take a few moments for a silent prayer of confession. I'll invite the communion stewards to come forward, and then we'll invite all of you to come forward and be served. Please be in prayer.
mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Would the communion stewards come forward, please? Again, let us pray. Holy, holy, holy Lord, full of power and might, we ask that you might indeed be with us in these days to come in what we call Holy Week, that we might see your journey, that we might be on that journey with you, that we might feel what you felt in such a way that it transforms us, changes our life. And we pray, Lord, that as we leave this place today, you have somehow through your word, through your spirit, through your presence, through your table, offered us a, a new way, uh, equipped us in a new way, enabled us or encouraged us in a new way to reach out to those around us, that we might be a channel of your peace, a conduit for your spirit. <clears throat> Bless us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Friends, as you leave this place today, again, may you ignore the Lord's blessing upon you. May you feel him on your journey, now and always. Amen. We're going to dismiss today by singing Sanctuary. It's number 655 in your hymnal. So would you stand and sing together?